This is It Takes Two with Jack and Amy on the Mighty 790 KFGO and on 94.1 FM and worldwide on KFGO.com. Every day this week, we have been featuring a few first ladies with the first ladies man, Andy Oak, and he joins me back here now on KFGO Radio. Hello, Andy. Hey, Amy. How are you today? So we've got a lot of great response from our listeners about your ridiculous first lady's knowledge that you've been bringing to our show every day this week. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. When I finished that that travel and the research for the C-SPAN series, I came out of the back end of the project kind of like Rain Man of First Ladies, and, and people seem to enjoy it, so I'm glad your listeners are as well. Okay, so here's the deal. Let's start out the show like this. Um, we are going to fe- feature two first ladies today and talk a little bit about them. I want to play some word association with Andy with words and first ladies, although I've given him no words that I'm going to use. And if you have a word that you want me to use in our word association game, you can text in at 35270 and I'll get them there. But let's first tell people where they can get your book and where they can learn sure. more about you before we go any further. Well, at firstladiesman.com and my fantastic web administrator, jo- administrator Joe Wilk with Shadowfire Hosting is listening now. I just saw he put up a Facebook prompt, and, uh, and, and he keeps firstladiesman.com on the Internet and, and working, and I've got videos and interviews, all the shows we've done together. You can order signed books and T-shirts there. Learn about me. There's links to the C-SPAN series and all kinds of stuff, videos I've done full speeches, partial speeches, question and answer segments. It's it's a full-service website, firstladiesman.com. It's got everything you need. Also, um, I already know a few people in my family who want books because since you've been on the air, they've been texting and calling me about your books. And so um, if you know anyone who's just interested in history or, I mean, and I, it should go further than that, too, because this is information that no one has ever shared with the world about our first ladies. It seems that we know a lot about our presidents and we don't know about the ladies that are right beside them in the office. And so this is an interesting way to study our, our history, really. And, and American culture. And it's kind of a travel log. And it's, it's just kind of a, a fun read. You learn about how television series are made during it too. I, I really, I really cover all the bases. I, I write the way I speak, or, or so I've been told, and uh, and people seem to get it and and have a good time with it. Okay, so let's start with our ladies. We're featuring a lady from Volume One, which was your first book, and Volume Two, which was your second book, Volume One, and it goes um, in chronological order, I should say. So our our first first lady is more a, a historic. First Lady, and the second First Lady we'll feature is more of a modern-day First Lady. Is that how you'd put it? Yeah, that's the way we've, we've been doing it. And we, we left off yesterday with, with Helen Taft, and, and that was a great example of a First Lady responsible for a lot of things in our modern world, yet we didn't know who she was, really. You couldn't name Helen Taft if you were naming 5, 10, 15, 20 First Ladies. And I want to start off today with Abigail Adams. This is going even further back. I mean, I'm sorry, Abigail Fillmore. I guess got so many women running around in my head, so many first ladies. <laughs> Abigail Fillmore. But, but most people, and myself included before the series, could not have named uh, President Miller Fillmore's uh, wife, being Abigail. When she's the first first lady with a day job, if you can believe it. Really? Uh, no first lady before Abigail Fillmore worked in a traditional you know, salary or, or hourly day job. They, they sure, certainly ran the homes and ran the plantations and, 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 and did work, but Abigail Fillmore started teaching full-time in 1817. She was about 19 or 20 years old, and it's actually where she met her future husband. Miller Fillmore was a student in her class at the age of 19. He was her oldest student, and he was learning to read and write and all these things in a formal school setting in uh, upstate New York, uh, outside of East Aurora, uh, New York. And that's where she met. They were just sort of, you know, teenagers, early 20s, when Mrs. Fillmore had that job. And that job would roll over into her married life as she would do tutoring in the front room of her two-room house that Millard Fillmore built. And you can go to this house today. I mean, that's the whole thing with my book, is that I can show you places and tell you places to go to learn about these women. And you drive right down this street in East Aurora, uh, uh, New York, and it's, it's like a neighborhood that I live in, that you live in. It's 
driver, and then boom, right in the middle of the street there is is Millard and Abigail Fillmore's house, where she taught people in the in the front room, students. But the incredible thing about Abigail Fillmore, when she moved into the White House as First Lady, she was surprised to see that in 1850, there was no library in the White House. So she went to Congress and asked for money. She said the White House needs a library. And at first they pushed her off to the Library of Congress and said that they could share books and do this, that, and the other. And it, well, she wasn't getting very far, so she had a party. She threw a party and brought both sides in and all the lawmakers and started walking them around the White House and talking to them about culture and literature. And finally, she convinced them to give her $2,000 to build this first library in the White House where she put her piano and all the works of Shakespeare and Dickens and brought these authors in to do readings and had concerts and famous musicians and pianists in there. So she made this this social salon, maybe one of the first social salons, in, in well, definitely in the White House, where they could have these cultural engagements and these cultural entertaining. So, you know, it, it's a pretty significant move in, in bringing this type of culture, this type of literature, this type of entertainment into the White House and, and into the nation's capital, which she did as First Lady. Can you imagine being a First Lady in the 1800s, 1850, and you go to Congress and ask for money? It, it's, it's truly remarkable. It I, I really mean, is. <laughs> <laughs> these these women from from beginning, and we've gone over this, and I can't reiterate it enough. Have stepped outside of their traditional roles, their 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 gender uh, uh, roles, their gender specific, uh, typical uh, social activity, typical education. Every single one of these women was unusual for her time. When I found out, not just unusual for women, but unusual for men. Anyone of the day, these were remarkable women that got put into this role. We've said before is that these are the most powerful and influential unelected and unpaid women in the world just by virtue of who they're married to. Abigail Fillmore. Yesterday we featured Abigail Adams. How many of them share the name? Ab- How many other Abigail First Ladies have we had? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's it. That's that's just, oh, okay. that's just, just those two. Yeah, I was like, am I am I missing something? Huh. Uh, no, 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 no. That's those are the only Abigails. Okay, those are the only Abigails. Do a lot of them name share? Are there multiples with the same name? Yes. You know the, the funny the funny thing, especially with the, the short answer is no. There, there aren't there aren't too terribly many uh, repeats. But in the beginning of of our country's history, in the 1700s and 1800s, daughters were. Excuse me. Daughters were named after their mothers. Like we've got, you know, typically men are a junior or the third or this. But Abigail Fillmore had a daughter who was named Abby. I mean, her nickname for Abigail. And and they women named their daughters after themselves. Abigail Fillmore's daughter Abby was a harp player. And when when Mrs. Fillmore suffered from a little bit of ill health and she also had a weak ankle, so she couldn't stand very long at social engagements her daughter would fill in for her. So Abby would fill in for Abigail, but she also would sit in this salon and play the harp, uh, the dust the harp there, and, and be part of those, part of those uh, uh, musical performances and salons as well. So between the, the women and their daughters, especially in the 1700s and 1800s, is where things got confusing with a lot of people named Martha or a lot of mm-hmm. people Elizabeth <laughs> or named after their mothers and would also fit in and fill in before that first lady's role was defined as much as it is in, in, in modern times. But there, there really is, there's, there's no definition for the role, and each first lady can make it uniquely her own uh, as she sees it. I am antsy to get to the second first lady that we want to talk about today because I am, yeah. I am so interested in what you are going to tell us about Jacqueline Kennedy that we don't already know because this is one of the first ladies that we know her name, we know what she looks like. We often think we know a lot about this first lady. And so how do you go about finding things out about this first lady that we don't already know? Yeah, and we, we, we scratched the surface on this a little bit yesterday, too, is that this was one of the big challenges for the series. And Jacqueline Kennedy was probably the hardest chapter I had to write in, in, in either of the volumes, one or two, because of what you just said. Even if you don't know everything about Jacqueline Kennedy, you think you do. And it's hard not to get 
pigeonholed or, or have blinders on and go to those areas that we do know so much about. And the Kennedy story is just so magnificent, good, bad, and, and, and otherwise. So I had to dig deeper into places that we knew and things that were familiar, but what didn't we know? What was the part of the story we didn't know? But Jacqueline Kennedy, which I did not know, was the only first lady to win an Emmy Award. And that Emmy Award is on display in the, in, in the Kennedy Museum in Massachusetts, in Boston. But it, it aired, I'm, I was familiar with, with the special, that it, it, was, it aired in 1962, it was right around Valentine's Day, February, all the networks ended up carrying it. I think it, I think it, de- it debuted on CBS, but then all the networks ended up getting, getting licensing for it to be able to air it. But it was done in black and white. And so all of the video and all of the stuff that we have seen in the past and know from that is this black and white broadcast. But adding that Emmy to it was a neat little twist. But then seeing the actual outfit that she wore is very telling about Mrs. Kennedy and reinforces how much we knew about her style and how she knew to wear the exact right outfit at the right occasion, at the right time, which particularly helped her on the, on the international stage when she would do foreign trips with her husband. But she wore a red Chanel coat and dress suit. Um, in, in very typical Jackie style, a short little coat with, with big buttons and, and, a, and a knee-length skirt, but But that red was for Valentine's Day in February. And even though she knew that it would be in black and white, and no one expected it to be in color, and and no one until, you know, you still go to the the library in in Massachusetts today, and you see this outfit on display with the Emmy, and you're kind of shocked because it's this bold red. But everything in our head knows that we saw that in black and white and didn't even know that it was red. But style was such a highlight for her. But additionally, what I found out was just how intelligent she was from the very beginning. She was a creative thinker and outside the box from a little girl. They have poems and songs that she wrote in grade school about the ocean and and seagulls and sailing and going out on adventure. And not only would she write these poems and songs, which were pretty good, too. I mean, like, even for the beyond the, the age that she was when she was writing them, she would make little drawings on the side, little starfish and sailboats and waves and seagulls. And so she just, she had such an outward expression and creativity to her. It's no wonder that this goes on into her fashion and how she helped uh, her husband and was such a great uh, personal and professional partner to her presidential husband. Okay, can I keep you a little bit longer than expected? Yeah, sure. Okay, Let's go. we're gonna we're gonna put Andy Oak, the first lady's man, on hold. We're gonna get to Sarah Heinrich with some egg news, and when we come back, I want to play word association. Is that okay? Yeah, this will be fun. Word association with first ladies. I haven't given him any of the words, but if you've got a word idea, you can text me at three five two seven zero. We'll be back with it takes two in just a moment here. This is It Takes Two. Andy Oak, the first ladies' man who's been featured on our show each day this week, has stayed with me for a little bit longer. I wanted to play fun first lady word association. So I'm going to say a word, and then Andy, the first ladies' man, is going to tell me what first lady comes to mind when I say this word. You ready for me? I've, I've never done this before in all my first lady's travels and interviews and everything, and you've given me... No hint to any of these words are, so I'm I'm nothing if not curious. <laughs> I'm excited. Um, these are just a few that first came to mind, and maybe and maybe you'll now that we've talked about Abigail and Jacqueline, maybe uh, well, well anyway. Okay, music. Music. Well, there's a lot of them that come to mind with music because so many of them were classically trained, but I'm going to go with Elizabeth Monroe. Elizabeth Monroe is the first first lady that comes to mind with music because it's the first musical instrument I saw on the first trip for the series. And I went to Fredericksburg, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C., where Elizabeth Monroe lived uh, with James Monroe after they moved down from New York. And there was a, um, a piano forte there that Elizabeth Monroe was classically trained to play and would entertain in, in any kind of salon or, or social setting. Money. Money. <laughs> Mary Lincoln. Mary Lincoln, because people thought that she was, was uh, a spendthrift, said that she bankrupted uh, Lincoln, 
and said that she wandered around with money sewn into her petticoats and dresses and things. <laughs> uh, and it turns out that she was not hurting for money nearly as much as people thought she was in, in her retirement and in her uh, post-White House years. Food. Food. I'm going to go with with well, Sarah Polk. Sarah Polk comes to mind because they were one of the most, and when it came to entertaining and, 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 and dinners and state dinners and stuff, Sarah and James K. Polk were, were two of the most lavish. I mean, they would do like 16 to 20 some odd course meals that would last for hours. And, and the, 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 the place settings all were different for each of the different courses. Very, very extravagant. Very, very elegant. Oh, my goodness. Um, infidelity. Infidelity. Oof. It's too many to mention, uh, unfortunately, yeah. but, but one that we don't think of a lot uh, would be Florence Harding. And the reason why I mentioned Florence Harding is that uh, President Warren Harding and Florence Harding lived in, in um, Marion, Ohio. And just like any other couple, like your parents or, or my parents, have got like bridge partners or, or uh, family friends that would come over and, and, and have dinner and play card games and stuff. And Warren Harding had an affair with the, with the woman of, of this other couple uh, that, that they would play cards with. And one of the reporters, the local reporters there in Marion, was walking down the street one afternoon and saw Florence Harding come out of her house and throw a three- or four-legged uh, piano stool at this woman saying, stay away from my husband. So, uh, you know, people, it's in, it's in, our, it's in our news today, uh, you know, with, with President Trump. You go, you go back, some of them are, are you know, just alleged. We, we, don't, we, we can't confirm many of these. But, you know, it, it's not anything new with this president that these accusations come up and, and some of the more infamous ones that we, that we know notoriously are, are you know, are, are obvious. Andy Oak is with us. He is the first ladies man. We're playing a little word association before I let him go for the day. And then he'll be back in the noon hour tomorrow again to feature two first ladies. Um, this one is selfish, but we're on it. Radio. Radio. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to go with Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt gave a radio address to the nation and thus the world announcing the attack on Pearl Harbor in mm. World War II. I mean, if you think about this, the nation and the world heard about one of the deadliest attacks on World War II, uh, I mean, on, on, on U.S. soil ever, uh, a significant event in World War II, and the way they found out about it was by a First Lady's radio broadcast. That, that's just, that's, that's astounding to me. That's incredible. Um, this one, I was going back and forth. I guess I have two words written here. Sunshine or nature, and those, I guess, are two totally different words, but I started with sunshine, I got to nature, I'm not sure why. Well, let's start with nature and then work our way back to sunshine. For, for nature, I think of uh, Lou Hoover, because she was, you know, everyone knows the Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue. Well, Lou Hoover is a girl named Lou. I, Lou is not short for anything not short for Louise or, or any other name. Wow. Her father wanted a boy, got a girl, and named her Lou and took her out camping. Now, there's pictures. She's the original Annie Oakley. I mean, she's the, she's the original tomboy. And, and the things that I've learned about her in West Branch, about her independence, she even had a, 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 a junior high school essay called Independent Girl, and it talks about just going out and exploring and conquering the world finding another independent soul to become one with. I mean, th these women were, were truly advanced in, in, in thinking and, 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 and almost every category to, to put them in the position to meet these men and marry these men that would become president and, and be such an equal partner in this leadership throughout the years. So Lou Hoover with, name, with sunshine, I, the, first word that, the first name that pops to my head is, is, um, is Nancy Reagan. And, and Nancy Reagan being not originally from California, but we know her as a Californian and being out on the ranch with her husband. Nancy Reagan had a crazy childhood. And, you know, if you, if you read it and, and look at the details of it, there's no way she should have ever been in the White House. I mean, her, her parents lived in New York and got divorced when people weren't getting divorces. And they were in the theater and sort of running amok and living a crazy lifestyle. And they shipped her off to her aunt and uncle just outside of Washington, D.C. She lived in Chicago for a little while until she got to California and then met Ronald Reagan when he was 
president of the Screen Actors Guild because her name, her acting name, Nancy uh, uh, Nancy Davis, was on a blacklist of potential communists, and she wasn't getting any work. And so she went out to, to uh, lunch with president of the Screen Actors Guild, Ronald Reagan, to have her name removed from this blacklist, and it was nearly love at first sight. And, oh and the rest, what they say, is history. I love that. Okay, one last one, because I'm selfish. Sure. And this is a more abstract idea than than the uh, the words that I the basic words I've been giving you. But my last one is justice. Justice. <sighs> yeah, Woo! I know. Um, <laughs> Helen Taft. Helen Taft, because her husband William H. Taft did not want to be president. He was a judge, and 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 uh, Helen Taft's father was a lawyer. And I mean, so many of these 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 politicians and, and leaders were in law and were judges and lawyers and things like that. But Helen Taft, if it wasn't for Helen Taft, uh, William Taft would not have been president because he, he wasn't shooting for that. He was supposed to be a Supreme Court justice, and he had a, a promise from President McKinley. McKinley appointed him to be governor of the Philippines and go over there and fix that mess just before the turn of the century. And, and he went over there with the promise that if he did a good job over there, he would come back and be made a Supreme Court justice. So he goes over to do everything that he's supposed to do and did a fine job, did a wonderful job. The Philippine people love Taft, especially Helen Taft. They threw great parties, and there's a lot of artifacts from their times over there. But then William McKinley gets assassinated, and the deal for Supreme Court justice dies with William McKinley. He comes back, and he becomes friends with the Republican Party and uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and Theodore Roosevelt decides not to run for another term, and the Republicans put Taft up, because he did such a good job, he ended up, after the presidency, to be the only president to be a Supreme Court justice. But Helen Taft really pushed that career along right into the White House. And, uh, and, and he, in, in, it, for, from my studies, I could say that if he had married anyone other than Helen Taft, he would not have been president of the United States. Good stuff. Andy Oak, the first ladies' man. You can find him online at thefirstladiesman.com. You can find some links at kfgo.com as well. And this will be podcasted so that you can listen to it later on today. Thanks so much, and thanks for playing along with my word association. That was way too much fun. I want to do that every that day cool. now. <laughs> that was cool, Amy. That, that, that was a new one on me. I, I enjoyed that. And uh, I look forward to talking to y'all tomorrow. Sounds good. Have a great day. Andy Oak, the First Ladies Man on KFGO.